Yeah, it's almost zero here, two, lead two. So if you take that one, lead two, the axis is going to be perpendicular, 90 degrees to lead two. And the lead two is? Lead two. If you go back to the... Lead one is basically the zero degrees. The lead one is is a bit arbitrary. So by convention, lead one is taken as a horizontal line that's running across this from zero to 180 degrees. So that's lead one. Lead two is 60 degrees. So this is 60 degrees positive. Lead two is 60 degrees positive. Lead 3, 120 degrees positive, 190 degrees positive is AVF and normal axis is between minus 30 to plus 90 degrees for adults, normal axis. So if you've got a lead which is now isoelectric, the positive and negative deflection is equal in lead to which is 60 degrees. So 90 degrees to 60 is this, which is minus 30, right? That is minus 30. And then you look if it's absolutely equal, that is that this is the axis. Minus 30 is the axis or, or QRS frontal axis in that patient. Let, let the paper come, hex axis, because once you hold it in your hand, it'll be easy, it'll be very easy to look at the hex axis system that identify the leads in which the both positive and negative deflections are equal or close to equal. The axis, QRS axis is, frontal QRS axis is at right angles to that particular lead. Right? So, that is going to be our, uh, the way of calculating it. There's a little bit more technical in which you, you know, basically take the number of small squares, how many small squares up and down, and then you draw them on the same leaves and draw the perpendiculars, but that's a little bit more complex. Next. If you just go. We've discussed this, but just to reinforce, 0 to 180, 0 to plus 90, minus 30 to plus 90, minus 92, C. For adults, for adults, it is minus 30 degrees to plus 90 degrees. If it is more negative than 30 degrees, minus 30, what is it called? Left axis deviation left axis, superiorly directed axis, left axis deviation. If it is more negative than minus 30, left axis deviation. And if it's more positive than plus 90, then it is right axis deviation. That, that basically holds true for adults, not for pediatric patients. Next. Uh, you want to do this or you want to leave this? Next, go next. Next. This is next. 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 I think we've not this done this. Next. 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 Yes. Talk about this one. Choose the correct interpretation of this ECG. Normal sinus rhythm, atrial fibrillation, sinus tachycardia, junctional escape rhythm, accelerated junctional rhythm. What's the, what's the definition of sinus rhythm? B wave, upright B wave in inferior leaves, in leaves two and three in ABF, yes? Now, you don't know which lead that is. 
we are not given this information. All we are given is that we see upright QRS complexes in a given lead, and this is, you know, I think probably the second lead here. So we don't have a no P wave here. Do we have any P wave or P wave here? Preceding the QRS complex? So we don't have P wave preceding the QRS complex. What about the QRS complex size? Are they normal? Are they wide or abnormal? What, what kind are they? Hmm? They look narrow. The wide ones, the description of wide ones, the definition of wide is more than 110 milliseconds, more than two and a half small square or three small square. So they look narrow, fairly narrow. So they're not abnormal, they're, they're not wide. Is this slurring just at the end of QRS complex? You can see that there's a dent there. Yes? There's a dent or there's indentation at the terminal end of the QRS complex. Now that is a buried Q wave, uh, P wave. There's a buried P wave that is at the end of the QRS complex. So P wave is basically following the QRS complex. It's not preceding the QRS complex. And if we had more information, if the resolution would be better, probably you'll see that in a given lead, in a field lead, the direction of that would not be upright. It will be downright. It will be negative. So most probably, it is coming from the... What, what, what's the definition of atrial fibrillation? Irregularly, irregular, narrow complex technical, commonly, commonly, not always, or it can be a broad complex, but commonly narrow complex tachycardia, which is narrow complex, basically, irregularly, irregular, narrow complex. It doesn't have to be again tachycardia, it can be slow atrial fibrillation as well. So atrial fibrillation is irregularly, irregular, commonly narrow complexes. In certain situations, they can be very broad complexes, such as atrial fibrillation with wolf parkinson white syndrome. So it is not irregularly irregular, it's fairly regular. So it is unlikely to be atrial fibrillation. Sinus tachycardia, what's the definition of sinus tachycardia? Hmm? But it should be sinus rhythm as defined earlier, but the rate should be 100 or above. Rate should be tachycardia is 100 or above. So it is not 100 or above. The rate is slower than 100, so it's not sinus there. There isn't any sinus there anyway. So junctional escape rhythm. Junctional escape rhythm. Yes. Why? Because there's, there's indentation at the terminal end of the QRS complex and that's probably a buried P wave which is coming from the junction and it's narrow QRS complexes. So most probably it's escape junctional rhythm for two reasons. Narrow QRS complexes. Always remember whenever you're looking at tachycardia or bradycardia, first identify the QRS complex duration. If it's a narrow, you are home and dry because you basically excluded the broad complexes. Right, so narrow complexes basically you usually are the supraventricular. So in this patient, this is a junctional escape rhythm because there's P wave buried at the terminal QRS, the QRS is narrow and it is bready. The rate is slow. Accelerated junctional rhythm. Well, accelerated junction rhythm basically is going to be uh, in the range of normally junction rhythm is about 40, 45, right? And if it is accelerated junction rhythm, it's going to be a little bit faster than that. So you'll have the QRS complex followed by P wave, but the rate will be faster, a little faster. So that is accelerated junction rhythm. It's a slow one, so this is a junctional escape rhythm. Next. Uh, we'll just skip this one for the time being. We haven't discussed the tachycardias yet. Next. I just want to... Right. I think we can discuss this one. Can you see it clearly on the, on the screen? Because it needs a good resolution. The resolution is not very good there, but it's a good one here. 
Can you count? Can you count the? Can you look at the QRS complexes there? What do you think? Choose the correct diagnosis for the ECG. I think it's probably unfair because of the resolution problem, but it's very clear on the on the uh, screen here. Pardon? Normally, you would expect to find, now this is important, please remember this. In a normal ECG, as all of us, we are sitting here, we are not the same. Our heights are not the same, our colors are not the same, our sizes are not the same, our voices and etc., etc., everything. But still, you recognize that each one of us falls loosely in the category of normal. And when you see somebody who is only four foot and two, you know it's a dwarf. It is not normal. It falls outside that category, although the same person's got the same color and eyes and ear and everything. But the, the you know, the loose uh, sense of being normal is not applicable in that particular person. Similarly, somebody who's six foot and eight inch, Alan Channa type, is not normal, falls outside the category. Similarly, when you look at the ECG, you have to identify the normal variables. It's not going to be exactly the same ECG for everybody. It is going to be slightly different. To know the normal variables in the ECG is important. One of the normal variables is that you must have a Q wave, normal Q wave in lead 1 and AVL. 1 and AVL and V5 and V6 these are the leads which should have a normal Q wave. And the normal Q wave is which is less than one small square in duration and less than 25% of the amplitude of the R wave. Right? So you should expect to find Q wave in lead 1 and AVL and V5 and V6. And if you do, don't see that, this loss of sept is called septal Q. As I said, the activation of the ventricle is from the postero-basal portion of the septum to the right. From right, from left to the right, but it's from the postero-basal portion of the septum towards the right ventricle. So, because the electrical axis is going away from the left ventricle, you register negative deflection in the left ventricular view. One AVL, V5 and V6 are left ventricular views. So you're going to find Q wave here, but there's loss of Q wave when there's no normal activation of the septum. There's a problem there. So if there is a bundle branch block, left bundle branch block, because that is the one which is associated with blocking the, this activation, you find loss of septal, no Q in one AVL, V5 and V6, no Q wave and broadening of the QRS complex, broadening of the QRS complex. If it is broader than 120 milliseconds, that is called complete left bundle branch block. And if it's less than, uh, it's between 100 and 120 milliseconds, it's called partial left bundle branch block. So there are two prerequisites for diagnosis of the left bundle branch block. Loss of septal Q1, AVL, V5, and V6. Loss of septal Q1, AVL, V5, and V6. No Q wave. Normally, you should find a small Q wave. And second, the duration of the QRS complex will be broader than 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is two and a half small squares. It's bigger than two and a half small squares. So either three or more than three is complete left bundle branch block. Less than three is partial left bundle branch block. So in this patient, you've got loss of septal Q1 and AVL, and there's broadening of the QRS complex, but it's not broader than three. So it is basically a left bundle branch block. Right bundle branch block will be associated with RSR pattern in lead V1. They'll be not normal, this. There'll be R there, big R there, positive deflection. Anterior fascicular block will be a left axis deviation. Right, and this is going to be left axis deviation, it's not there. This and there, this is not there. So this is left bundle branch block. Next.
Right. Can you can somebody? I think I think I'll discuss that at some other time because it's unfair to ask. I have not discussed it. Let's go to a common myocard infarction. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next. 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 Uh, right. You want to do this? It's easy. This is. Hmm. No, let's, let's, is P wave normal, PR interval looks normal, because between this and this is usually, is three small square or more, QRS is normal, the width is normal, QRS duration is just narrow QRS, and then ST is isoelectric, T is there, same here, the same morphology of P as this, the same morphology and T, and then sudden, I mean here, look, they look the same, and here, there is something missing there. And again, it's a P wave, QRS complex, and then T, P, QRS complex, T, P, QRS complex, T, the same, regular there, regular there. What happened here then? Sign is there with me? Hmm? Type 1, second degree AV block. What is type 1, second degree AV block? Wenke-Bachin. Wenke bachin is called type 1 second degree AV block in which progressive lengthening of the PR interval. There is no progressive lengthening of the PR interval. So this is not progressive lengthening. Sinus arrhythmia. What is sinus arrhythmia? Sinus arrhythmia is a name given to the fluctuations in the QRS, PQRS uh, complexes, cyclical changes associated with respiration in young people. So young people in which there is respiratory movement and there is swing of the QRS complexes along with that respiration, the QRS are wider, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I beg your apology. The RR interval is wider, that is the heart rate varies. The heart rate goes it goes up and down in relation to respiration, right? So respiration basically has got a strong influence on the heart rate in young people, and that is seen as sinus arrhythmia on the ECG, that the rate changes in relation to respiration. So it has to be in relation to respiration. Two, it has to be cyclical, coming, going, coming, going, and increasing and decreasing the RR interval. With inspiration, basically, you get tachycardia. With expiration, you tend to get a little bit bradycardia. So that relationship has to be seen in a cyclical fashion, not just one beat missing there. It does not make it uh, 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 sinus arrhythmia. So this is not cyclical here, right? All they've shown you is uh, a, something regular Q, P, Q, R, S complex is a sinus beat, sinus beat, sinus beat, something amiss, sinus beat, sinus beat, sinus beat. So what is amiss? Sinus arrhythmia, I've told you, it's not. It's type 1, progressive lengthening, is not. Type 2, basically, is fixed PR interval, but usually it is 2 to 1 block. So you have to see 2 to 1. Where is the 2 to 1 block? It doesn't show you. It only shows you one missing beat. 2 to 1 block, you have to see 2 P waves to 1 QRS complex. 2 P waves to 1 QRS complex. So there should be 1 P wave and then 2 P wave and then should be QRS complex and pun. See on so forth. It's not there. So this is not type 2. Third degree is complete AV dissociation. You are seeing complete association. This P, 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 P. So it is not complete alpha. So what is this? This is sinoatrial exit block. The sinus node discharged, but it did it block was there that it did not spread out. And sometimes that happens in elderly patients. Sometimes that happens in patients with myocarditis. Sometimes that happens in patients with degenerative disease like sick sinus. Sometimes it happens in patients with digoxin toxicity. 
and so on and so forth. So sinoatrial block is associated with P wave QRS complex, normal sinus rhythm, and then suddenly no P wave, no QRS complex. That's sinoatrial exit block. So this is what it looks like. It can be prolonged. Here it was able to recover quickly. If it's a prolonged one, it can cause collapse or Stokes-Adams syndrome, as we call it, and that is a feature of sick sinus syndrome. So one of the manifestations of sick sinus syndrome is sinoatrial exit blocks associated with either syncope or presyncope. Next. Right here. That's beautiful, isn't it? Now you will make a diagnosis of this. Any one of you just start saying something. Dr. Tarek Mia? Pardon? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. PR interval, and look at the PR interval is longer than this. And this is longer, this is further longer. Uh, sorry, it's longer and then there's a drop. There's P there and there's a drop. And then again short, again lengthening, again drop. P, lengthening, P, lengthening, again drop. So what is this? Which one is this? Wenki Bachen. This is type 2, second degree heart block, type 1 or Wenki Bachen. Wenki Bachen is called, uh, this is type 1, second degree heart block. So second degree heart block can be of two types. Type one, progressive lengthening of QRS complex, or progressive lengthening of PR interval, followed by dropped QRS complex. And type two, when there is two to one heart, two to one heart block. So you've got two P waves, QRS complex, two P waves, QRS complex. There'll be a more two or second degree heart block. Sinus arrhythmia, I've told you again, repetition, cyclical changes. You must see a cyclical changes. Three or four waves are closer and three or four RR interval are wide apart. PR interval is the same, no change in PR interval. In sinus arrhythmia, no change in PR interval. The change is only in the RR interval. The heart rate varies in relation to respiration and it is commonly found in young people and it is a normal finding. So do not ascribe any pathological significance to this. Next. Choose the correct diagnosis for this ECG. First degree AV block. Let's describe the ECG. It's easy. I mean, if you look at the ECG, you can say there's a P wave followed by QRS complex, is a T and P QRS complex T and the P QRS complex T and P and QRS complex T. Huh? This one? First degree AV block, type 1, second degree is not because there's no progressive PR interval lengthening. Type 2, 3, exit block, it's not exit block, we know that. Huh? Pardon? So you all agree there is a there's prolongation of the PR interval beyond the normal and that is up to up to 200 milliseconds or 5 small squares. So the PR interval is prolonged beyond normal uh, limits and that is first degree heart block. What are the causes of first degree heart block? Common causes. 
may be found in elderly people, rheumatic fever. Remember, in rheumatic fever, your clinical practice you may see in patients with rheumatic fever. So fever with arthralgia, sore throat, you may find first degree heart clock, which is common finding in patients with rheumatic, active rheumatic fever. It may be found in patients with myocarditis. It may be found in patients with digoxin, taking digoxin. So first degree heart block is, does not, does it require pacemaker? No, it does not require anything at all. It's just an ECG finding. Next. Choose the correct diagnosis for this. P, just say lead V1, so P, QRS complex. Do you think the normal duration of QRS complex? They're broad, they're wide. So it's widening of the QRS complex. It's a P wave there, broadening, and then T and P, QRS complex, P, QRS complex, P, QRS, they're all almost regular here. And then P, something is, hmm? Something not there, and then P, QRS complex, P, QRS complex. And then the same continuation of the same P, P, and then P, a miss, then P, a miss, and then P. So, what is the diagnosis? What about this one? You think it's a pre excitation? Yes. Hmm? Why? That can be very good for discussion because if you say that everybody will understand why it's not or why it is pre-excited. Hmm? ST segment? All right. In pre-excitation, we said pre-excitation, the word pre-excitation means it is excited, it is basically getting activated before its time. Pre-excitation is bypassing the normal rules of AV nodal delay. So therefore, by definition, the PR interval in these patients is going to be short. By definition, it's going to be short. And short means less than 120 milliseconds. So the PR interval has to be less than 120 milliseconds or less than three small squares in any pre-excitation, whether it's a PWBW or it's a long genome leaving syndrome, LGL, but it's going to be less than 120 milliseconds, three small squares. This is not three, it's more than three small squares, so it's got nothing to do with pre-excitation. You should be able to say so straight away, there's no question of pre-excitation because the PR interval is normal. And secondly, the QR complex is as usually there's delta wave, but then delta wave depends which lead you are looking at. In V1, it may not show you the delta wave in WWS. Pardon? Sorry, this one? You mean this is delta? No, this is not delta. This is intraventricular conduction defect. Intraventricular conduction defect results in widening of the QRS complex. Delta wave is an upright, it's a slurring on the upstroke of the R wave. Delta wave is up slurring of the upstroke of the R wave. It's not an S wave. So delta wave is always, the def definition of that is, and slurring on the upstroke of R wave is called delta wave. And that's due to fusion of excitation coming via AV node and via bypass pathways and result in widening of the QRS complex. So what is this? PQRS, 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 P and no QRS. So there's a dropped beat there. There's a dropped ventricular complex. This atrial complex, but no ventricular complex. Again, normal, 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 and again, P, not QRS complex. And again, there's P, P, not QRS complex. 
and again P and P, this sinus conductor beads. So the basically is a sinus conductor beads with broad QRS complexes indicating intraventricular conduction and then suddenly there's a drop of QRS complex without progressive lengthening. So this is type 2 second degree AV block. Drop beat without progressive lengthening. If it's progressive lengthening followed by drop beat, there will be Mopitz type 1 or Venkibach. This is type 2, second degree heart block. Pardon? I think there's a hearing problem. Uh, I can't hear you properly. Right. It can be that way and it can be this way as well. That you have a going sinus rhythm followed by just drop of P wave is there is a drop of ventricular complex. The one that I told you is a regular. For example, here now it is one, two, three, four, five complexes, one a miss. One, two, again, three, four, one a miss. Here now it is becoming more frequent. Here it is becoming more frequent. So as you go along, you may see that it is now two atrial complexes in one ventricle, two atrial, one ventricle. Depends upon the fatigue of the AV node. If AV node is getting very much fatigued, you may get only two atrial, one ventricle, two atrial, one ventricle, two atrial, one ventricle. Or it may be like this at the beginning and then it may progress to that. But the feature is that the PR interval is fixed. It may be prolonged. It may be prolonged in these patients. But whatever, the length of PR interval will be maintained throughout that rhythm. So if it's prolonged, it will be prolonged in all the complexes. And then there will be drop of the ventricle complex after the P wave. So basically P wave not followed by QRS complex with fixed PR interval, which may be normal, which may be prolonged. So this is Mopitz type 2 heart block. Next. Next. Dr. Nasir, do you want to continue or do you want to stop or what time do you want to stop? We can ask the audience. We can do the infarction? All right. What what can help to differentiate between the normal septal Q and the pathological Q wave? We've discussed it. Can you just identify width? Yes. If it is broader than one small square, 40 milliseconds, it is pathological. If it is smaller than 40 milliseconds, it is physiological. Height? Yes, less than 25% of the R wave. So width and height, both width and height is important. The QRS axis? No. The axis has got no bearing on the physiological or pathological Q wave. The axis can be just anything. The specific ECG leads involved? No. So this is the answer C. Both width and height of uh, Q wave basically would determine whether it is physiological and pathological. Can you just tell me again, just for the sake of repetition, what leads gives you a physiological Q wave? One AVL V5 and V6. Just say it. One AVL V5 and V6. Physiological Q wave is found in 1 AVL V5 and V6. And loss of that Q wave in these leads is indicative of left bundle branch block. Left bundle branch block. So physiological Q waves basically are found in 1 AVL V5 and V6. And absence of that is found in patients with left bundle branch block. Next. In an acute Q-wave MI, which ECG finding is usually first to appear? 
in an acute Q-wave myocardial infarction, which ECG finding is usually the first to appear. Q, hyperacute T, T inversion, ST segment elevation, none of the above. The earliest abnormality on ECG in acute myocardial infarction is hmm? hands up for T wave inversion, uh, ST elevation. Uh, not everybody. Now, hands up for T wave inversion. Very few, very few. Hands up for B. That's the one right? Correct. That's the one. So it's only three. Well, the rest is silent majority, I think. The ST, hyperacute T wave is the one in which the earliest abnormality in ECG in acute myocardial infarction is ST elevation. Uh, sorry, uh, hyperacute T. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm not saying it's specific. There's the earliest change in patients with myocardial infarction. They're found in other conditions like hyperkalemia. But again, this is due to local hyperkalemia. That's why it is. Because with myocardial infarction, there's a leakage. There's myocardial necrosis. And the myocardial necrosis leads to outpouring of the intracellular um, elements. And the, the biggest num the biggest intracellular element is potassium. So there's a local hyperkalemia, and that local hyperkalemia results in the production of hyperacute T wave. You can say that it is not found in every patient. So patients with myocardial infarction, I, by the time they come to you and me, and we do the ECG, they might have passed that stage, and now more ST elevation has taken them. So, but the earliest abnormality in patients with myocardial infarction is the hyperacute T wave followed by ST elevation, followed by ST elevation and then T inversion and then Q wave. What is the The question is that is how do we get The best thing is you have to take all the information. If you look at the ECG, you can only say this is an abnormal ECG, but the abnormal ECG does not make it myocardial infarction. So if patient is presenting with chest pain, severe chest pain, everything, everything fits in. A clinical history, you have got the ECG signs, you've got comorbid condition, risk factors are there. You may also have cardiac enzymes on your side, or two out of three, history, enzymes, or ECG. So two out of three are required to make a diagnosis. If you're looking at a young person, very young person, as I told you in the very first ST elevation with hyperacuity found an 18 year old who is just running away, having a marathon, no problem. And you look at ECG, you start suspecting patients got myocardial infarction without taking into account that he is a healthy 18 year old boy or a girl. So you have to take everything into account. ST elevation or T hyperacuity taken in conjunction with good clinical history of severe chest pain or chest pain and then ECG or enzymes, yes. But on its own, if it's just looking only ECG, you may say, look, this ECG looks abnormal, but I have to look at the patient first. Yeah, but as I said, 
in certain number of patients, young patients, you may have only ST elevation or uh, T hyperacuity in septal leads because those patients is called constitutional. So you have to look at those things in relation to the patient's symptom and the history. Did I not show you the first, the new, the ST elevation can be normal. In that, if you look at ST, can we just go back and, and just show him?